Gerald Steele, and this is a series of videos about just sharpening writing up a little bit for our legal writing students and um, some techniques that we can use to uh, analyze our writing and see if we can um, see what we're communicating and maybe make it a little bit stronger. So I want to show you first today something that is not legal writing at all. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. But I thought we'd start with something in the more in the popular culture, it's something that I like. The article uh, or piece that I want to have a look at with you is uh, by David Goldblatt. This is an extract in the Guardian newspaper online uh, from David Goldblatt's book, The Game of Our Lives. It's just a short extract to tease the book. Uh, David Goldblatt is one of my absolute favorite writers. I like reading his nonfiction about soccer or football, we'll call it football because he's in Britain and the Guardian is from Britain. And he has a really amazing uh, style of writing. It's just extremely engaging. And so I wanted to have a look at this little extract with you. I'm going to switch over to uh, these pages from the Guardian so that we can examine uh, Goldblatt's piece uh, a little more closely. I'm going to read each of these lines because I realize it's the first time you'll be seeing it, but I, I want to read it and then we'll make some observations as we go. Uh, first, just notice we're going to look at this from the start. So we've got a starting, a starting paragraph uh, here. It goes over to this page. That paragraph continues. Um, we have this paragraph, short one right there. And then we have uh, a third and a longer fourth paragraph. And of course, we want to realize that what Goldblatt is doing with this extract through The Guardian is to sell the book, The Game of Our Lives. So he wants to make this a very appealing story that brings the reader in. So if we start here, uh, Goldblatt starts as football completed its mutation from idiosyncratic aristocratic pastimes to the most significant popular cultural practice of working class life. It came to embody in its sporting, cultural, and commercial norms a changing class balance. Let's take that first sentence. And one thing we're going to do in looking at writing is think about what is being communicated to the reader. And one of the most important things that our brains are, are trained to pick up as we're reading are the, the main concept of a sentence or its main clauses, uh, main clause in, in subject and verb. And sometimes uh, the subjects and verbs of lengthy. Uh, additional clauses close by. Uh, the first noun that the reader encounters here is football. And in fact, if we go to where this, the uh, subject and verb of the sentence actually are, you see that the subject of the sentence is it, which refers to football. So football came to embody is the first place uh, we start here. Football came to embody. Let's go to the next sentence. On the one hand, the game retained traces of the rough and rowdy, spontaneous, carnival-esque uh, characteristics of football, urban, rural. So in this sentence, uh, we have the subject being the game and then retained traces, retained traces of rough and rowdy. So that's, that's what we expect this sentence to be about. It's about the game and its retention. Okay, notice the contrast here. Football is really the subject of both sentences. Goldblatt has changed the noun he's using to keep things a little bit interesting. Uh, but he's, he's setting us up here for a change. It came to embody. He's placing us in time, right? We've got what it was and what it came to embody. And then here we're saying retained. So we're about to hearken back to what that embodiment retained. And those are the concepts going forward. In the next sentence, he says, these games had been tied to Saints Days. These games had been tied to Saints Days, local festivities and rituals, and proved too boisterous, uh, too threatening for the right order, rigid order, pardon me, of Victorian city. Again, these games, now we've got a little variation on the subject. Football, game, games. Now we're being a little more specific. We're thinking in terms of games, events had been tied. This is a, a past perfect tense. He told us retained. So we know we're hearkening back. And indeed, the past perfect tense allows us to do that. It goes back to see what the games had been. 
But what became of them? Remember, we're looking what football came to embody. They proved too boisterous. This is a compound main verb. The games had been tied and proved too boisterous. So had been tied and proved. So games been tied, proved, which sets us back to our current time frame. Uh, the next sentence, judicious use of the riot act, riot act as well as depopulation, meant these games were all but extinguished by the 1850s, but they lived on in the ludic zoos of the public schools. So uh, judicious use of the riot act, that's an interesting subject. It's compelling, something we might want to know more about. And that judicious use meant, so we're getting an explainer. We're being, we're being introduced to a new concept, this law, this judicious use of riot act, this social force, and we're told that it meant something. But they, back to the games, this is a compound sentence, so it has two main subjects and two main verbs. They refers us back to the concepts we were in last time. Remember how football, game, were retained, now games, games, lived on lived on is a, is a very compelling verb choice. So riot act meant an explainer about what changed. However, but games lived on. That's a story here that Goldblatt is telling us. In the next sentence here, football first served. Football, again, is our subject. Served is our main verb. First served as a form of pedagogic social control and was then shaped into. This is a complex sentence that uses the same subject for two verbs. It first served, and is our conjunction, was shaped into. So we've got served, shaped. So we're seeing this, this morphing, this changing of football that's being described to us. Remember the thesis sentence of this paragraph. It came to embody. So this paragraph is about telling us a story of change, and now that's happening. We were sent into the past to see what would be retained. We were told that uh, games lived on. And now looking at this new time frame, football served and was shaped. So it's changing into a ground of new Christian masculinity. The game, uh, half civilized and half regulated, became an exemplar of pluck and courage, the healthy mind and body. We have here, it's a, Technically, uh, uh, I call it a run-on sentence. I wouldn't recommend this for scholarship where we're trying to keep things simple and accessible, but this is a, an artful narrative. He's using a semicolon to create a compound structure, the first half of which is complex. In the second half, we're given a new subject, which is game, but of course it's not really a new subject. We have football, game, just as we had before, football, game half civilized, half regulated, became an exemplar. Again, became a term of change. So served, shaped, became. We see the story of football, the game, through this sentence. Let's go to the next sentence. For much of the 1860s and 70s, football association, football association and its rules, a compound subject, presided, a verb over a small, cultic practice made up of clubs that had their roots in the nation's leading public schools. Football association is a new concept introduced to us here. The football association shows us something of what this football mutation we were told about in the first sentence, what this mutation meant. It goes from working class life and now it's in a football association, an organization founded in 1863 with rules a compound subject of football association and rules, and it presides, right? So we've had a, a, a significant shift here. Football completed uh, mutation, came to embody, we're being told a story. We go back in time where it had an almost uh, a religious significance among working class people. Uh, at the top of the page, we see the change as it moves into the schools. Finally, we have an organization we have rules and they preside. We have a governance structure is what's being suggested to us. Notice where the next paragraph will begin, the aristocracy. 
So we're, we're looking at this rule-based organization, and now we're going to move into the aristocracy. So we're, we're changing our frame of reference. Um, moving into that paragraph, aristocracy never quite had, never quite had. So this, this paragraph is going to be about the aristocracy. Notice that, again, we're looking back here on the first page at the top, on the second page in the second paragraph, the first sentence of a paragraph is important. It's a thesis sentence of the paragraph. It tells us what this paragraph is going to be about. The first sentence at the top told us that this was a story about the mutation of football. The second paragraph tells us that this is about the aristocracy, a story of the aristocracy interacting with our subject, with football. The second sentence in the public schools, universities and professionals were joined and professions they were joined by the football playing sons of the bourgeois. So we've got universities and professionals. Uh, they were joined by. So we've got this meshing of our old conception of football we were told about in the top paragraph with this new subject we're being introduced to the aristocracy that were joined. The middle classes, in the next sentence, the middle classes followed suit. So we're being told a story about football and, and social classes. Middle classes followed suit as uh, the game was spread to the grammar schools, teaching colleges, urban parishes, and so on. So we're adding a new subject to the story here. A, a story of social class is being added to this story of mutating football. Let's go to the next paragraph. By 1875, the game had reached working class brain. The game had reached. So we're still talking about football. Remember that before we've seen Goldblatt twice we use the subject switch from football to game just to keep the language interesting, but the subject always focuses on the same thing. And here again, now we have a paragraph that leads off with game and had reached. So we're talking about the had reached the working class. Let's see if this paragraph is about how football had reached the working class where its instant popularity made it something of a craze. In the cotton towns of the Lancashire Valleys, in the steel towns of South Yorkshire, in the factories of the Midlands, and the working class slums, football, it's a late subject in the sentence, mania, football mania, took hold. This is actually a simple sentence. Its structure is simply subject, verb, it's very short. But look at all this text that comes before it, a series, a string, of prepositional phrases in the cotton towns, in the steel towns, in the factories, in the slums, football took hold. That's a very powerful device. It's something to keep in mind for your persuasive writing and appeals. This uh, forces the reader to work through these iterations, to see this list of things and, and have a feel an impact from this list of things. And then given a strong, simple sentence, football took hold. The next sentence, by the mid 1880s, working class clubs and increasingly large working class crowds came to see them and, en and engulf the hitherto exclusive world of aristocratic football. So the working class clubs, working class clubs and large working class crowds are our compound subject. They came to see. You see what's happening here. We've got a story being told, as we were promised, about the working class and how it became part of the football story. We're given this series of prepositional phrases that it illustrates who this working class is, the broad range of colorful backgrounds they come from. Football takes hold with them. They come to see. There's a compound structure with a semicolon again. Again, not something I'd actually recommend for scholarly writing, but for a narrative, it works beautifully. The challenge, the challenge was not just on the pitch, where Northern class teams were now regularly thrashing their Southern amateur counterparts, but in ethos too. So challenge was, challenge was, it's not a very powerful structure, but it marks a shift in this paragraph to saying this, this sort of beautiful introduction about how the working class came to see, but all was not well in the kingdom. Challenge was, there's something wrong. And there was uh, in the next phrase, even though this is a subordinate structure um, where Northern class teams were now, 
still the concept, the powerful word choice, thrashing, gets the reader's attention. So the main, the main subject verb of this uh, compound clause, challenge was, is not terribly strong. It introduces us to this challenge. It states that it exists, but then this subordinate clause provides this really terrific color about that challenge. With the crowds came money, and with money came payments. Uh, with the crowds came money. This is uh, using a prepositional phrase to invert the subject and verb. Uh, it's not something that you really have to do consciously as a writer, but it happens sometimes grammatically, and it can be a good, useful device. Came money. It's almost a, an art, an artistic way of saying it. Came money. Uh, with money came payments. So we've got a repetition of the verb. Uh, and that's deliberate because he's showing us that this was the challenge, that there was something, there's something afoot. What is it? Other things are coming. It's not just the working class. Other things are coming. Money, payments. The emphasis because of the inversion of subject and verb is on the coming, came, came. And what is coming? Money, payments. That's of concern. Football, the subject is restored to the game where we started in the paragraph. Football was increasingly about, increasingly about. Again, not, not a terribly strong verb choice normally, a be verb was, but we're trying to illustrate this change. The game reached, football became about, was increasingly about winning, not merely playing. So we see a fascinating transition in this paragraph. It is about the introduction of working class to the game, but it also signals a shift in the middle. This is a transitional paragraph that is setting up attention for us. The first part of this paragraph tells us about the working class. The second part of this paragraph transition us to a challenge, an alarm, an alert. There's a problem. Okay, there's a problem now. So what is going to happen with this problem? As the reader, I'm baited, I'm interested. I hope the next paragraph is going to tell me more. And it does. Something would have to give. Right? That's, that's a remarkable transition. Right? Here I am waiting for answers. I want to understand what's happening. My gosh, there's something dramatic that's happened. And then there was a challenge to the dramatic change something would have to give. What a powerful phrase to start this paragraph off with. Something would have. It's not really an infinitive to give, it's not really a, a powerful phrase in its diction, in its word selection, but it's a powerful phrase because it's short, it's a simple phrase, and it gives me what I expected, it gives me what I wanted. And notice the kind of uh, uh, verb choice here. This is would have. If I can take you back to the beginning, uh, football came to embody, the game retained, the riot act meant, this is, past tense, um, and then we get back where he's giving us some of the background, um, where he hearkens back to the story of football, and I mentioned the use uh, somewhere up here, I mentioned the use of uh, past perfect tense to tell the story that led up to the present time frame that he's working with, and even right here, had reached is our past perfect tense. And now he's using a conditional present, would have, would have to give. In other words, it's speculative. We don't know what's going to give. We're told that something happened, the story of football through the past. We're informed of the distant past, the past perfect, to tell us what that was about. And then we move to a, a present conditional to say, what does this mean? What is, how do we speculate? Uh, about the significance of this. It was the FA that shifted position. It was the FA, the Football Association, that shifted position. Something would have to give, and it was. He's not going to leave us waiting long. He's going to tell us about it. And this paragraph is going to be about this change, but set within this conditional present tense, this uncertainty. In 1885, professionalism was legalized. Professionalism was legalized. So professionalism is again the shift in subject 
from the game to professional. The association is introduced and we're back to professionalism. Remember that theme when the football association was introduced the first time up here and it presided. Now we have something having to give and the FA and professionals. With the FA there came, there was a fundamental wing, fundamentalist wing, which would not accept professionalism at any price. Fundamentalist wing would not accept. So professionalism was legalized, but fundamentalist would not accept. Again, attention. Attention in the present conditional. They went on, they went on to create a doomed amateur only breakaway in the south of England and staffed the ranks of the Corinthians. They went on to create. So there's a, again, a division a split that's being described. Breakaway tells us that explicitly, serving this tension that, that Goldblatt is building. He has a, a, a dash, you know, discourage writers from using dashes in legal writing, but it's a narrative device when you need it. Strictly amateur touring club, which for a short period combined brilliant football with an exaggerated, a gentlemanly sense of fair play. However, a transition that we might expect, a, a shift in perspective in a, in a paragraph that's about tension. <coughs> it was pragmatists, it was pragmatists that won. So we've got again a competition. It was pragmatists that won. Like their political equivalents, they recognized. So now we're telling the other side of the story, the other side of the coin, the pragmatist story. They recognized that they had to accommodate some of the demands of industrial, of newly organizing class, um, moving on the gradual widening of male suffrage. Widening of male suffrage is the subject. And the introduction of regulated professionalism were, in the words, in the worlds of politics and football, prices worth paying. So we're being given much more, uh, much deeper, much more specific subjects here, widening of male suffrage, introduction of regulated professions. Um, these are new subjects. These have not, particularly the male suffrage, this hasn't been talked about before. Um, we're being introduced to a range of new theories here. In the worlds of politics, price is worth paying. Moreover, in both politics and football, accommodation created, accommodation created, room for old elites, new settlement, universal male suffrage would sit back to the present conditional alongside constitutional monarchy. Again, new subjects about politics, male suffrage, constitutional monarchy, hereditary house, professional football. So we've got this semicolon juxtaposing this, these subjects in politics with the subject of sport. Professional football would be permitted. So again, we've got this tension between politics and sport. Uh, but, but, another transition like however, showing tension, the social and moral consequences would be checked. This tension continues, and it continues in that present conditional tense. So we've got this unity from the beginning of the paragraph to the end of present conditional. We're being told an ongoing story in the time frame the author wants us to be in. And now we're set up for a, a dramatic tension of the forces of politics and sport, the forces of social classes that is unfolding in the present. It's not really our present, but it's an illusory present that the author has created for us. So that the aristocratic FA would remain the sovereign body of the football nation. FA would remain still present conditional tense. And if we know anything about football, the FA remains today. So that's a real teaser to say, okay, how am I going to get from this illusory present, this present conditional that the authors created for me, to my present day? I'm just full of questions now. How is this tension in social classes, this tension in politics and sport, going to illustrate a transition from football as it exists in this present conditional time frame the authors created to my time frame, what I understand to be the case today? I mean, that is just a really beautiful exposition. If we can go back and look again, look at what the author did here from the very top. Football completed mutation in a subordinate phrase and came to embody, right? That's what, that is the thesis sentence of this paragraph. It's also the thesis sentence of this extract. So that 
thesis sentence controls both the paragraph and the entirety of this essay, the entirety of this extract, and it, it delivers. It's telling us a story of mutation, a story of embodiment, how football came to started as a game and came to mean more, and it delivers. We start with football in this paragraph as mere game. At the bottom of the extract, football is now about social classes, about economics, about politics. So we're being told this story of mutation. The extract delivers on what it promises. And again, that thesis sentence controls both paragraph and the entirety. As, as you look at the overall structure, this opening paragraph tells us what this story is going to be about. The opening paragraph begins with popular culture. It ends with a foot, let me change color here. It begins with popular culture. It ends with football association. The essay in whole begins with cultural practice. It ends with football association. You see the parallel. So we're being told a story in the first paragraph, and that is a thesis paragraph. That thesis paragraph is a, is a reflection of the extract in its entirety. The overall structure again goes from this thesis paragraph and, it, and then gives us two transitional paragraphs, two transitional paragraphs, which shift, they take us on this journey from the past perfect, from the background, onto the present conditional. Where are we today? In our, at least the authors today, the time frame he wants us to be in, in the late 19th century. So he takes us on this, this journey through these transitional paragraphs, which introduce the new concepts of social class. And then this final paragraph in the present conditional brings us, brings in politics, brings in economics, and sort of opens the field for where this essay is going to go next. And boy, if you don't want to read the book at the end of that, right? And that's, that's really, you know, aside from some other devices we talked about in there, the use of these repeated prepositional phrases in the transitional paragraph to, to, to illustrate a picture, some really beautiful word choices such as the, uh, uh, I've got pragmatists here, I've got thrashing here, um, we've got, uh, let's see up here, um, uh, I remember some others, um, the, the sort of teaser of the riot act here, what was going on there, saints these. Um, there's a lot of uh, beautiful diction going on in Goldblatt's uh, narrative to keep us engaged. And, and make this bigger than life and illustrate something in our minds. So that is David Goldblatt. And again, one of my absolute favorite writers and just beautifully telling the story. We're not writing books for legal scholarship and papers for classes. We're not writing books about uh, football in the 19th century. We're not doing historical narratives so much. How does all this, uh, what does all this mean to us? Um, let me take a look, if you will take a look with me at something else. So this is an article I chose, I just pulled out of the, out of the files. Um, it's an article I wrote with Jose Benavides uh, more than a decade ago, a good while ago, um, about uh, uh, football and uh, LGBTQ rights. Um, the subject matter is not, not terribly important for us, um, but I just wanted to, to pull it up as something of my own to work with so I can pick it apart and be mean to it and uh, no one will mind. Um, this is published in the West Virginia Law Review, but I just pulled a draft out of my files to work with. The uh, table of contents is messed up because I, because I was just using a draft here. But let's go into the top of this article, and I want us just to look at the introduction together. So in this article, we're talking again about the governance of football and. Uh, LGBTQ rights and how is football governance dealing with this human rights issue. From the start of the introduction, let's do that same sort of subject verb mapping. International sporting events such as the Olympics, World Cup, um, unfold on television screens. The governance of international athletics is not so public. Organizations such as IOC, and FIFA operate behind closed doors. Non-public entities leverage 
the world for sport audience, they, they the same non-public entities, bend national governments to their will, and a conjunction for a, a, a compound sentence, but the subject repeats they, non-public entities, venomously protect their corporate partners. IOC and FIFA have been named. This is passive voice. Uh, we might talk about that a little later. We can't really write letters very well here in Adobe, sorry, but that's passive voice. Um, we'll talk about that later. It's, it's uh, often not a deliberate choice. It should be because it's a useful device, but one that has to be used carefully. Um, FIFA has been embroiled, again, passive voice, but the effect here is to repeat the subject and tell us things about FIFA in transnational indictments. But the transition tension, their powerful franchises grow. Okay, subject verb franchises grow. Behind the scenes, notice the structure of a prepositional phrase, uh, behind the scenes of public events is a cloak and dagger world. So here we have these prepositional phrases creating the subject verb inversion, the subject and verb of the sentence being cloak and dagger world is, cloak and dagger world is, of backroom dealings with the makings of a spy thriller. All right, that's the first paragraph. I want to go continue a little more and then we'll come back there. Um, Actually, I can't do that because I put the illustrations right here. So let's look at this paragraph while I'm here. What's going on in this paragraph? Uh, I've got, uh, uh, let's look at the subject verbs. I've got sporting events, Olympics, World Cup unfold. Okay. Governance is, and then I deliver on the, I'm telling what governance is, Jose and I deliver transnational organizations operate. So we're starting with the setting of, of the Olympics and the, and the World Cup. It's a little slow to respond. World Cup. And then we're going to tell you about their governance, how they operate, these non-public entities, same subject throughout. They bend national governments. Uh, they protect, and yet, passive voice, what is happening to them, they are named in scandals. They are embroiled in indictments. But transition, despite their operation and their bending and protecting, they are embroiled and indicted, but they grow. They grow. And this cloak and dagger world is a spy thriller. So you see, we're creating this tension from the very get-go. We've told you what this article is going to be about. It's going to be about sport governance, about the organizations that run the Olympics and FIFA, about how they uh, operate, what has happened to them as a result of that operation, and then about their uh, manage, how they've managed to survive that, how they can operate despite what happens uh, in that environment of tension. All right, I want to, uh, let me go on. Now, let's go to the next paragraph of this introduction. Uh, this is paragraph two, remember, that's a two. Despite the secrecy and unknowns about how international sport is governed, so subordinate clause transitioning from the governance, which that first paragraph was about. Organizations such as FIFA, same subject, we're still dealing with the same subject, are. So this thesis sentence tells me that this paragraph is going to be about what the organizations are. So telling us a little bit more about how they operate. They, same subject, can be relied on, can be relied on. So they're consistent, right? That's what that means, they can be relied on Consistency is the next subject. So we're, we're transitioning from subject to subject within the umbrella of these organizations and what they are, what they are, what their meaning is. Consistency means, so we're going from 
We're establishing consistency. Now we're going to talk about what consistency means, its definitional impact. Next, this study specifically considers. Okay, notice the transition that's happened within this paragraph. We've taken you from the broad subject. I can't write it, but I'm trying to say governance. The broad subject of governance. That's, not, that's a mess, but the broad subject of governance onto this study. So we're carrying you, reader, from our broad subject to our narrow study. And the word specifically is even indicating to you, hey, this is a narrow study. Let's go to the next paragraph. Got a paragraph break and a third and final paragraph in the introduction, recognizing the historical interplay of civil rights and international sport got a subordinate present participle phrase. It's present participle, we're locating the reader, we notice the present tense here, we're locating the reader in the present, this study, and the study. So the subject that we introduced, that we transitioned to at the tail end of the intermediate paragraph is now the subject of the new paragraph. The study begins. So in, in general legal writing terms, um, in, in terms of social science scholarship or legal writing, this is a roadmap. Right? And I love to see that as a reader. I want to see a roadmap at the top of the paper. I want the reader to tell me exactly where this paper is going to go and show me what the map is. This is uh, somewhat equivalent. If you, if you think about this as a roadmap in legal writing, and you might have seen that in memo writing or in brief writing or both um, in your uh, first year studies. Same thing in legal scholarship. We're telling the reader uh, where we're going to go, giving the roadmap. And we want this map to, to mirror the overall structure of the, of the article. This is equivalent to a, a methodology in social science. So the, the writer, the scientist, is telling us, this is how I'm going to do what I'm telling you I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you about this specific consideration of FIFA and LGBT rights. Well, I'm telling you about uh, how I'm going to do it. Uh, I'm going to tell you about part one part two, part three, this is the method by which I'm going to accomplish that objective, by which I'm going to inform you of this interaction on this subject. Um, and the roadmap paragraph here, it's real plain. Sometimes um, a student will say to me, you know, seriously, this is what you want me to do? I feel like I'm talking to a five-year-old. Exactly, yes, we're talking to a five-year-old. Part six concludes. I mean, it's that simple, right? But our reader needs to know. Now I also want to get into the paper. Let's go one more paragraph down into part two. I want each paragraph at the top of each section to do what it's supposed to do. So up, up in my description of part two in the roadmap, um, let me go back up just a couple of lines. In part two, with the recent experience of the Olympics in Russia and the World Cup in Brazil, it is in this context that World Cup plans to unfold in Russia in 2018 and in Qatar in 2022. So that's what part two is about. It's about the current situation transitioning from Olympics in Russia to World Cups in Russia and Qatar. If I go to part two, is that what it's about? The world's eyes were on Russia for the Olympics. That's where it starts. To tell you the truth, I think, again, you know, I'm not holding myself up as, as a model. I certainly could improve things all the time. I would even like to have seen maybe a sentence introduction there that reminds the reader about what part two is about, both the Olympics uh, of the past and the Olympics uh, and World Cups to come um, in this section. But I'm going to give myself a break on that because I just said it. I just transitioned from the last, uh, from the roadmap. But maybe at, at the top of part three, where I'm going to see a background on interconnection between organized sport and social activism, I sure hope, and I don't remember now, but I sure hope that that's the introduction of my part three right at the top. So the reader is getting a roadmap, we say, and then the reader is getting signposting. So every time I'm on the roadmap, I see a sign that tells me where I am. Now let's go back again to the top. Did I deliver on what I promised? International events such as the Olympics and the World Cup unfold, but governance is. 
So I'm, I'm telling you about the Olympics, about the World Cup, and then I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you a story of governance of those entities um, going, uh, and, and I promised a spy thriller, right? I go to the next paragraphs, notice the transition. Remember that from Goldblatt? We've got an introduction he gave us about the history, the, tr the mutation of football. And then he's had a transition paragraph that took us from that past. In his case, it was historical, so it was a past. I'm moving here from uh, an unfolding, an operation, but a tension, a present tense tension. And I'm transitioning to a specific study. Goldblatt was transitioning from, uh, was introducing a mutation from a past perfect history to a present conditional investigation. So it's a different, a different mission that he's on. But he had that background in the past perfect. He had uh, a transitional paragraph, which brought us to the subject of his study. And when I move down now, I hope I'm in it, right? And indeed, my roadmap is the present study. Uh, it says the study begins. Part two, we didn't look at the verbs in here, but part two, uh, I should say, pardon me, study begins in part two. It is in this context. Part three, study offers. Part four, study examines. Part five, unites these threads. So I'm being given background thread, background thread, background thread, unites these threads, and then part five, employs. Part six, concludes. I do, by the way, very much prefer the present tense here. Um, you'll see plenty of scholarly writers who talk about their paper in future tense. I don't think that works. Um, when you're talking about scholarship that was published uh, or primary sources that are published before your paper, you should be using the past tense. When you're talking about your paper, you should be using the present tense. Um, but uh, that notwithstanding, you see the transition is accomplished. So we've gone from an introduction about what governance is and a tension between uh, the forces working on governance and the exercise of human rights. We transition to this very narrow subject. And in this very narrow subject, we use the present tense to give a roadmap to this paper, which is going to uh, explore and carry through to a conclusion about the World Cup, which again was where the paper started, where the paragraph started. So I should have uh, an introduction that narrows it's like like an hourglass the introduction narrows to the specific study when it comes to the conclusion i want to back that out to the broad um, and i also want to see this structure reflected in the introduction i want to start broad the entire history of the olympics and world cup i'm narrowing through my transitional paragraph to the specific study which then kicks off and then i come back to the conclusion but even, even, I should say, even within here, there's a hint of a conclusion which will broaden things back out. So again, that hourglass shape happening here, uh, the hourglass shape happening in the paper, and the conclusion will come back and wrap things up, looking forward to the World Cup on the public stage in Russia and Qatar, which at this time of this writing are yet to occur. All right, same structure in big picture terms. It's the same structure Goldblatt's using. And it's not that I'm uh, uh, any good at this more than anybody else. Uh, Goldblatt is really good at this. But the idea is that there's something uh, natural about this. There's something innately uh, correct or appealing or right. Something about this approach which fits with the reader who expects a certain something in the reader's own human nature. The reader expects to be told a story. The reader wants to be given a broad stage to start with, something familiar, whether that's football or the Olympics or the World Cup. The reader wants to see the writer, or the writer needs to take the reader by the hand to narrow that down to the very specific study, and then to show how that's going to broaden out and add to the reader's knowledge about the broad subject. Um, and that's a structure then, again, that we can see repeated, uh, whether it's you know, in an extract, which teases a whole book for Goldblatt, 
In, in uh, my case with Jose Benavides, we're trying to write an introduction that will tease the reader into reading an entire article, but it's much the same thing. And we want to make it appealing. We want to draw the reader in. We want to set the stage and show the reader what, what is going to come. We don't use as, as that colorful, those colorful narrative techniques as, as much as Goldblatt does, partly because we're not as good at it, and partly because this is a law review article. So we're not trying to write a, a beautiful historical narrative, um, but a lot, a lot is in parallel in the two works. So I hope that, that gives you some sense about how you can approach your own work. Um, none of us is gonna score on the first draft. I mean, what we just looked at with my law review article could still stand lots of improvement. I saw a lot of verb structures in there that I now regret, but um, that was after going through countless drafts. Um, and so, you know, certainly the first draft that you've set down on paper, there's gonna be a lot of growth between that and what you might turn in. And that's still not going to be uh, ideal. Um, you can get it into publication and it's still not going to be ideal. But the idea is just to, to have the tools to be able to start to examine your work, to analyze your work, to say, how could this be improved? Um, so we'll look at that in the context of some papers as we go forward, some uh, short works of legal scholarship, and see if we can learn uh, and apply some of the techniques we've learned and maybe pick up a few more in subsequent videos. Thanks for joining me.